Uh, the economy is getting better. This is the first time that uh, in quite some time since essentially the summer of 2008 when this thing really started to fall apart on us uh, that we've really had some good news to, to, to give to you. Um, and things are getting a lot better in the economy and everything seems to be moving in the right direction for a couple of very important reasons which are unlikely to change in the near future, okay? So here's kind of the rundown of where, where we've been. Uh, the, the gray numbers are the U.S. GDP over this cycle and the green numbers are the uh, North Carolina GSP. One of the things that you want to look, lo look at is what happened in the second half of last year, fourth quarter, up and through the third quarter or second quarter of this year. And as you can see, um, it really there was kind of a hollowing out, if you will, of the economy, that dreaded double dip that everybody was talking about. Well, we almost got it, but we didn't quite get it. Um, it got down in North Carolina, it got down to basically flat in that quarter, and uh, that's the second quarter of 2011. But no, nevertheless, we managed to avoid the dreaded double dip uh, nationally and in the state. And as you can see, things have started to pick back up again uh, nationally. And certainly in the state, you'll see that things are starting to pick up again in the second half of this year going into 2000, second half of 2011 and going into 2012. Um, some recap here. Uh, we lost 8.7 million jobs. It's always a number you need to keep with you forever and ever and ever because that's kind of a big number. And that's kind of the mark that we're trying to erase is those 8.7 million jobs. Um, We've seen this before, this is where we've lost them. Remember, almost half the jobs were lost in manufacturing and construction. This was a, in terms of the burden of who lost jobs, this was a blue collar recession. Um, you know, business and professional services were third in line in terms of number of job lost with a million and a half, but the bulk of them were lost over here. Uh, in terms of where the jobs are coming back, um, they're coming back in business and professional services, educational health services, uh, construction is still down, manufacturing is up, and we've seen recently in the last, this is through December, and we've seen recently in the last couple of months some really robust manufacturing numbers as we seem to have, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to call it a manufacturing renaissance, but we really have seen some increase in manufacturing in this country in terms of job numbers, in terms of plants, etc., which has surprised a lot of us. And I'm not sure that it's a fluke, and I'm not sure it's over yet, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Uh, the only place that we've been losing jobs, of course, is in government, and that's predominantly state and local government. When the uh, fiscal stimulus dollars went away in July of 2011, uh, many states and localities had to lay folks off in order to deal with uh, the loss of those stimulus dollars, which were there to support primarily educators and uh, police, police officers. At the state level, we lost more jobs than we thought we did, okay? But, and again, here's where we lost jobs, predominantly, again, in manufacturing and health services, uh, excuse me, manufacturing and construction. Business and professional services uh, were the fourth largest drop. Retail trade was the largest drop, in the, uh, the third largest drop in this state. Uh, so that's where we lost the jobs. A total of 333,000 jobs were lost. When it comes to gaining jobs back, this is where the good news is. We've gained back more jobs than we thought we did. When we were here last time, we were talking about gaining back somewhere in the order of 30 or 40,000 jobs through the end of the year. It looks more now with the rebenchmarking of the data that we're gaining back, we've gained back 81,000 jobs. And so what we're looking at here is about 24.5% of the job losses, or roughly a quarter of the job losses we've gotten back in the last year and a half, uh, almost two years. If you go back here, uh, nationally, we've gained back about 33%. So we've gained back about a third of the jobs nationally. We've only gained back a quarter of the jobs in the state. So the state hasn't performed as well as the nation has going forward. And if you remember the chart we started this off with, and that was the GSP chart, uh, GDP chart, you'll notice that we didn't have quite as strong a growth as the U.S. did quarter to quarter. And so that's part of what's causing us some difficulty here. There's some other things we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later specifically about North Carolina and why it's lagged a little bit. But the good news is that the numbers are a lot better than what we were reporting last time with this rebenchmarking. Now what happens with rebenchmarking is these are surveys. Now this survey for the non-agricultural jobs, establishment jobs, it's a pretty big survey. It's about 30 percent of the firms are in fact surveyed. But it isn't 100 percent accurate and they collect much deeper data, much broader collection of data, 
but it's not as timely as the monthly survey is. And so consequently, every two years they go back and readjust the monthly data to reflect what they know to be the population numbers for the, for the employment levels. And so that's what's happened here. And, for, and it varies from time to time as to whether we do better than or worse than what we thought we were doing. This is one of those positive times when we wound up doing a heck of a lot better than what we thought we were doing. Because if we were here last quarter, if you were here last quarter, that number was half of what it was now. So things are much, much better, things were much, much better in terms of job creation in 2011. And, and that's not a surprise because the economy wasn't that bad. It should have created more jobs than it was creating in 2011. So we've got back 81,000 or a quarter of the jobs back. And as you'll see in a minute, the 2012 forecast is another good job year. Um, and so things will work out fairly well. Um, for the Charlotte MSA, I just thought I'd throw this in because, well, I was going back through doing the numbers and there they were. So we went ahead and took, took a crack at them and I thought I'd throw it in. We lost 86,000 jobs. That's a little over 10% of the employment the number of jobs that were here back in December of 2007. So we lost a lot of jobs. We've done actually pretty well. We've gained back, uh, we, we lost 86,000 jobs. Here's where we lost them in construction, manufacturing. Again, you notice there's no mining here. Um, and uh, business and professional services, but also we got hit in the finance and real estate area as well. Uh, a little bit harder than the nation did in, the, in that area simply because of the number of employees that were in banks during that period of time. It wasn't so much they were laying people off as that they weren't hiring anybody. And so just through attrition, we lost a lot of jobs during that period of time. Um, we've gained back almost half the jobs. So the, the MSA is in fact doing better than the nation and of course better than the state. So you know when you look at the thing, the state gained back 80,000 jobs, right? 40,000 of those were gained back in this MSA. Okay. So that'll give you a sense as to, yeah, if, we were, if you were to look at this before the re-benchmarking, uh, the MSA was doing it almost as badly as the state was doing. It just wasn't generating any jobs. But the benchmarking, the better data indicate that, hey, things actually have been a lot better here in 2011 than we expected them, both in the state but more so in the MSA. And that's a six-county MSA, by the way. So um, that, that's the, the extent of it. And as you can see, again, uh, business and professional services are leading the way, which shouldn't be of any great surprise. Uh, but also we've gained back a lot of the retail trade jobs that we lost as well. So that's some, some good news in, in that. And again, we've almost gained back half of the jobs we lost. So, you know, this, this local economy is doing better than the state and better than the nation, which is what we would have expected uh, when we went into this thing. We would have expected that to be the case. And uh, yet the data all along were telling us, no, you're doing worse, you're doing worse. And it was always everybody scratching their heads. Well, the truth of the matter is we are doing better. Um, so job growth in 2012, I think that's the, the, the real issue here. Now, if remember, we've added back about 3 million of the 8.7 we've lost. What is 2012 going to look like? Well, here is the really, really encouraging news going forward, okay? Just in the last five months, okay, in the last five months, we've seen a real resurgence in job creation in this country. And in five months, we've added a million jobs. You keep this up for the next 10 months of this year, that's another two million jobs. And instead of three million, we're at five million jobs. And we've added back two thirds of the jobs we've lost. Okay, so this is a very optimistic position that we're in. And there's reason to suspect that this job creation that we've seen in the last several months, and particularly the last three where we've, and you've heard me talk about this before. I've talked about this for the last two years during this re recovery. And that is we need to start seeing monthly job uh, uh, increases in the 200,000 range for us to start to feel like this thing is over. And now we've had three in a row, and there's no reason to suspect that this isn't going to continue. And the reason for that's really quite simple. If we look at the productivity number, um, and there's a number of reasons for job growth, uh, the things that we, we need to talk about as it re relates to job growth, productivity, GDP, gas prices in Europe. But let's take a look at the productivity, because that's really what the key is to why we're starting to see firms hire back uh, employees. If you look at 2009 into 2010, pro this is quarterly growth rates in productivity. Okay, so you can see that um, it's been running up as high over 7%, over 5%, about 5%, 3%, and 1%. And you've noticed in the last several months, it's actually become negative and we've gotten very, very low in the last year or so. And what that basically means is that employers simply cannot continue to increase output by two or three percent without 
hiring additional workers. They've run through the slack, if you will, in their potential of productivity growth. And now the only way they can increase output is to hire workers. And this has an incredibly reinforcing uh, nature to it. Because when they hire those million workers, that's now a million people that didn't have um, jobs five months ago, and now they have income and they're going to start to spend, which means that firms are going to start to see that demand pick up again, and they're going to have to increase their output. And with productivity growth as low as it is right now, the only thing that can happen is they're going to have to hire workers in order for this to take, in order for them to increase their output levels. Now, what's really interesting is, and the chart was too busy, so I decided not to try to show it to you. But if you go back and if you remember, coming out of the 2001 recession, how everyone was talking about how bad economic growth was, I mean, excuse me, how bad employment growth was. They talked about the jobless recovery, and it took a number of years. When you look at the productivity, you see the same pattern. In 2002 and into early 2003, we still had two and a half, three percent quarterly gro growth rates in productivity. Those are annualized levels, by the way. And it wasn't until the mid part of 2003 when productivity growth dropped back down again, i.e. when they used the slack up of the potential productivity growth coming out of that recession, that we started to see significant job hires. So my guess is here, my, my, my prediction is that we're actually going to start to see significant job growth in the next quarter uh, through, the, through the summer. You know, and that's guarded because there are some things out there we need to be careful about. But we've We've used up, if you will, this slack in the economy that allows um, businesses to <clears throat> excuse me, increase output through productivity without having to hire workers. And we're now back into a situation where uh, with meager productivity growth, they're going to have to hire workers to, to accommodate increases in the demand that they see. Now, um, the outlook going forward, and this is, you know, again, if you've been here for a while, you remember that last month the positive indicator chart only had one up arrow and only three items on the positive indicator chart. And now look at what has moved to the top of the list and wasn't on the t even on the positive indicator list last month, and that's consumer confidence. Have we got a great story to tell about consumer confidence? Consumers are getting back to being confident again. The most recent number is 70.8. Remember, this is really a consumer sentiment index and what it's looking at or what it, the questions it's asking are whether consumers are interested in are considering buying a big ticket purchase in the next three months or six months. And that indicates their willingness to either dip into savings because they can replenish it or to engage in a monthly payment and they feel secure enough about their employment situation that they're comfortable in, in, in uh, engaging in a monthly payment. And so what we're seeing is consumers, now normal is 90, but check this out, 70.8. Since this silly thing began back in October, November of two, 2007, when we started to see consumer confidence sl slip because of the the potential bubble, the housing bubble, et cetera, and after the tremendous crash in the fall of 08 and into the early 09, this is the highest marked, the highest consumer confidence number we've seen in this cycle. Okay? All right? This is a change. This is a significant change in what we've been battling in terms of the consumers for the last four years. So this is the most, one of the most optimistic things that I have seen in four years that indicate that consumers, yeah, we're back in the game again. We're going to start to, we're not going to consume like we did before, okay? We're not going to use our houses as, a, a, you know, ATMs. But we are, in fact, back in the market. We are going to start to consume. We are going to buy cars. We are going to buy TV sets. We are going to buy appliances. We are going to take vacations. And this is really an important thing. So consumers have changed because two-thirds of the economy uh, is, is consumption by, by, by households. And so this is very important that, they, that this fundamentally change. And we've seen really consistent the last two months this pick up. Um, household debt, we've, we've looked at this before. Uh, we're starting to see an increase in household debt here. Consumers taking on more debt. This is the period of time where they were deleveraging and decreasing the amount of debt. We've also seen that they're now down in terms of not close to the trough that they were in terms of the percentage of their income uh, and, and, and payments for, house, for, for household debt. This doesn't include mortgages, um, but you know, they're still, they're getting there uh, they're, and they're considerably off the peak just before the crash began, uh, occurred. 
Uh, so that's good news. Consumers can now engage in debt again and borrow money. So this is all pretty good things. Um, the dollar is fairly stable. Uh, we've seen it come down recently. This is, this is fairly important. Uh, the, the weaker or the lower the price of the dollar, obviously, the better our export are, that which adds to uh, our GDP, uh, but also it means that we don't take quite the hit on oil prices that we otherwise would, uh, okay, with, because it, it just, it helps us a little bit in that regard. Um, excuse me, the stronger the dollar, I'm sorry. Um, this is CPI, and this is the one little concern. Last year, the Consumer Price Index, it jumped up to 3.2%. Uh, a lot of that was driven by energy prices, but not all of it, okay? And so what we've got is a situation where I know the Fed has promised everybody that interest rates are going to stay low now through is it 2014, I think they've said, um, and, or at least to 2014. So they're going to keep them low for another year and a half to, to almost two years. But 3.2% um, is right on the edge of being concerned about inflation. So it remains to be seen what's going to, be, what's going to happen in two, uh, 2012 and whether or not inflation will come back under control if energy prices start to stabilize and start to come down again in the second half of the year. Uh, I was reading the paper this morning, I suspect everybody probably ch checked it out, that the, the, the forecasters of energy prices or gas prices are saying that we're going to probably peak in April. I do not forecast gas prices. <clears throat> I don't know why anybody does. Uh, but nevertheless, the, 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 the idea is that it will, it will exceed $4, but we should see the peak sometime in April, early May. Um, so anyway, that's, that's about what, what we're looking at here. Um, and hopefully, we'll have enough taken out of that in the second half of the year that it will keep inflation in check for 2012. Um, this, the uh, Federal Reserve, as I said, is going to keep rates low for the foreseeable future, somewhere between zero and, and 0.25%. Um, looking at the negative indicators, um, gasoline prices are clearly one of the things that concerns us. Uh, very, very much. Uh, we'll go through that, but here is the monthly gas prices. Um, you can see we've kind of run a roller coaster here. It's been coming down, uh, but in the last three months, it started to go up. It's now up to three dollars and seventy-five cents. That's the average in the first week of March for the United States. Uh, that is of concern, and the reason it is a concern is because of the impact that uh, a fifty-cent increase in gasoline prices. And if you look at this thing, you know we were down in December at a low of three thirty-three. We're now at three seventy-five, so we're getting close to that fifty-cent increment. We're getting very close to that fifty-cent increment. Another ten cents, and there we are at that fifty-cent increment. And when you have that fifty-cent increment, uh, it's taken one hundred forty-four billion dollars a year out of out of Americans' pockets. And that's a significant number because you remember how hard they were fighting for the payroll tax extension, that 2% payroll tax, to make sure that they didn't starve off the, the, the recovery, that they didn't you know, truncate it because of the, uh, the, the, the taking that 2% out of consumer pockets. Well, that 2% over the course of a year is about $160 billion. So you can start to see that this is online with, or in line, I should say, with the... Uh, the payroll tax reduction this year. And so we're giving you the 2%, we're giving you the 160, and the gas companies are taking away almost that much. So if it doesn't get a lot worse than 385, 395, it doesn't push past $4, it's probably not going to have a big effect on the economy because it's being offset by the Social Security tax reduction, at least this year. If it pa pushes past $4, it could start to become a problem because we go from $3.85, which is the first 50 cents, we go up to $4.35 or something like that. Now we're in the second 50 cents. That really starts to begin to take money out of consumers' pockets, which they can't spend elsewhere. So that is a concern. Um, we've got some new budget deficit numbers through 2020, 2022. Um, we're right here. Uh, we've managed to get that deficit down from a little over a trillion and a half down to about $1.2 trillion. So we're doing pretty good in this past year. <clears throat> this is the Congressional Budget, of Congressional Budget Office. They're respected as being fairly reasonable and not too partisan in their projections. And as you can see, uh, they are expecting the 2012 to be, again, a, more than a trillion, but then they really start to see a significant change in the size of the budget deficit. And in fact, what they're pointing out here is that by 2014, it will be below $500 billion. Now, let's put that into perspective, okay? $500 billion is really the threshold 
in terms of when budget deficits are problematic, because that's the three, the sort of the three percent rule. Um, because if you can keep your budget deficit at or below three percent of your GDP, and you can grow and you can grow your economy at three percent, your debt as a percent of GDP does not change. And so that's the, that's where the three percent rule comes from. And of course now we're sitting at nine percent. Okay, so you know we're really in serious trouble, but the Congressional Budget Office is suggesting that over the next one, two, three years, we should get back inside that, that uh, threshold, if you will, of, the, of 3% and get into a budget deficit that doesn't necessarily hurt us. And it's certainly no worse than what we had in the early 1990s. And in real terms is, in fact, less because these are not adjusted for inflation. These are actual budget deficit numbers, nominal numbers. Okay. Um, so you can see that hopefully if they're right, and you know, I'm not, for those of you that are calculus minded, um, I'm not real convinced that, yeah, the derivative has changed, but I'm not real convinced that the second derivative has changed as well or is positive. But this is certainly indicating that it is and that things are going to get a whole lot better quicker. Um, we will hope for that. And that would certainly be good for the economy if we can do it because uh, most of this will come from growth in the economy as opposed to tax changes. This will simply come because potentially three million more people will be working at the end of 2012 than we're working at the end of 2011. And that's significant in terms of the tax collections. Um, excess reserves still stand at incredible numbers. Um, this is basically fed by treasuries from the, the, the uh, banks and requiring them to hang on to these in the, in the form of excess reserves. Uh, but we're almost at, you know, we're over a trillion and a half in excess reserves. And um, the Fed is pumping money into the economy, but they're doing it more to keep banks cash rich than they are in terms of trying to promote lending. And so we haven't got to that point yet. There are some things going to be happening in the next several weeks with banks in terms of an additional stress test, make sure they've met their capital, new capital requirements going forward. We'll see how those turn out and whether or not that changes the way banks are behaving in, uh, in, in the lending front and whether they'll start to lower the, the, credit, uh, um, the credit level uh, for uh, borrowing money uh, so that we can get more folks engaged in borrowing money and more folks buying things on time, which will help the economy. Uh, okay, trade deficit, that's not going in the right direction. Just did the calculation. The, this is a forecast. We only have three quarters for 2011. But if it continues in the fourth quarter the way it did in the first three quarters, we'll be looking at about $560 billion trade deficit uh, annually. Uh, again, that's three, over 3% 3 of GDP. That's not a good number. Again, we're looking at sort of the 3% range here, 2 to 3% range for a, a trade deficit. Um, and this is uh, problematic. But by the same token, this is why this trade deficit, particularly 300 billion of it is with China. And this is why they have a lot of dollars that they can use to buy our debt. So. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it has a side benefit in the sense that it, it allows us to run without terrible consequences the deficits we've been running in the past couple of years. Um, this is home inventory. Uh, we're down to about six months supply uh, in uh, January. And uh, that is pretty good news. Six, I think 6.1 months supply, uh, which means that new homes should start to, I mean, we should start to see some pressure for builders to start to increase the inventory levels going forward. Um, our suspicion is we probably got one more pretty tough year in the housing business, uh, residential housing. Uh, maybe by the second half of 2012, we'll start to see things pick up. If in fact we do create those two million more jobs that we are expecting us to create over the next 10 months, um, it's likely that by the second half of the year, we will start to see some significant changes in the housing, residential housing market after five years, basically, of no activity to speak of. Um, and that would really, that would be the, the kind of the piece, if you will, uh, going forward in 2013, if we actually see the housing market pick up significantly in the second half of this year. Um, the Euro debt crisis, you've seen this slide before, but I just want to hit it one more time. This is Greece, 320 billion euros, uh, a little under $500 billion in debt. The debt to GDP ratio is almost 150%. Um, this number is obviously reduced in the last couple of months as they've uh, taken haircuts. Uh, but the problem with Greece is right down here. Um, and that is that while the rest of the world's economy is starting to grow, Greece is still contracting. 
the, the, the fiscal um, adjustments that they've made uh, have ensured that the Greece economy will likely not grow. Uh, the 2011 number looks like it's going to be a negative 3.5 to 4 percent when it's all done. And so it's really seriously uh, problematic, if you will, concerning Greece and their ability. The bottom line here, folks, is this, just so everybody understands. Greece is going to fail. And it's probably going to leave the European Union, or at least the currency union. And um, the question is, will it be delayed long enough to not involve Italy? Because Italy is the one that's it's kind of on the brink here because they're at two and a half billion euro. Okay? That's a real number. A lot of what, and, and for them, for borrowing costs to go up, would severely restrict their ability to pay their bills. And so hopefully what can happen is they can get their house in enough order. They are growing, modestly, but they are growing. They're a little bit different picture. If they can convince the markets that they are, in fact, on the track for being able to pay this debt back, then it's likely that this euro crisis that we've been dealing with for the last year might not turn out to be quite as bad as we think. And my estimate, my guess is, if we can push the Greek failure back to the second half of this year, probably it'll be a non-event. Okay? Probably a non-event. Okay? North Carolina forecasts, well, last year, first half of the year was lousy. The last quarter, not so good, but better. Okay? In other words, most of the growth we got for the year, we got at the very end of the year. Okay? Um, when you look at the sectors that have done fairly well in terms of growth, it's a mixed bag. Manufacturing, particularly non-durables, has taken a hit this year. Uh, Agriculture is down, but it's a very small sector, so it's not that big of a, a deal. But if you look at where the growth has been in, in terms of output, business and professional services, finance and real estate, um, insurance and real estate, information and wholesale trade, um, and health and leisure services are all been the ones that have been growing. Um, and when we look at the year-end employment trends, this is all based on the new benchmark. We, we added about 33,000 jobs last year, okay? Um, so that's about a nine-tenths of a percent increase. Ideally, we'd like to be adding one and a half to two percent increase in jobs a year. But this is not bad given that when we were here last quarter with the old data, it was looking like a half a percent increase in jobs for the year. So it turned out to be a lot better than we thought it was going to be. What we see here is that the job growth has been predominantly in services and trade, although we have seen an increase in jobs in durable goods. And that's something to keep in mind. Uh, remember I talked to you about we've seen a manufacturing resurgence in terms of job creations and new companies. But it's been principally in the durable goods area, not in the non-durable goods area. So, you know, we've seen that in this, in this um, state, and we've seen even construction jobs go up uh, this year, okay? So it is really first breath of fresh air, if you will, in terms of job creation we've seen in this year, 33,000 jobs. Next year, the, the picture is a lot brighter. Uh, overall, we're looking at a 2% growth rate for the economy and GDP. You can start to see that we're starting to see a considerable increase here in um, um, a lot of non-manufacturing sectors, but even durable goods is going up. And on the job side of things, I want you to look at that number. Our, our outlook for 2012 is for basically 50,000 new jobs in the state. Now remember, we lost 333,000. We've only gained back 80 <clears throat> through December of 2011. So this only gets us back uh, to le just less, a little less than half of the jobs back. But it's a whole lot better than where we have been in the past few years. Considerably improvement in terms of our job numbers. 1.3% growth, if we can get that up to one and a half, 1.6%, um, things would be pretty good. Now, I know that a lot of folks are really nervous about going forward. Gas prices scare people. The crisis in the Middle East and its effect on gas prices scares people. And the European debt crisis that we've been living with for the past year or so scares people. But I think that there's enough momentum in the economy that these things are not going to derail a pretty nice 2012. And so while I would like it to be a little bit stronger than it is, there are enough things kind of chipping at the edge that I think that, you know, a little over 2% growth in GSP, 1.3% uh, growth in employment, um, I think are all positive uh, factors going forward and I think are, are within the grasp, if you will. I think they're attainable. 
I'm not sure that there's anything out there that's going to de derail this. And in fact, if anything, I would suggest to you that it could be better than this. And we'll have a much better idea in June when we do the forecast because we will then know what, a whole lot more about what's going on this year and whether or not we're going to get into some kind of trouble and what gas prices are. So that's really kind of looking forward. If there's anything, there's an upward bias to this forecast. It could turn out to be better. There's one kind of sad spot in this whole thing, and that's our unemployment rate. Um, we have managed to you know, run about a percent and change higher rate of unemployment than the United States. Right now, uh, they just released the January number this morning at 1030 in North Carolina. It's 10.2% compared to the U.S. level of 8.3% in January. Um, so we're almost two percentage points higher. Right here, we're at the end of 2011. Uh, we're about 1.6 percentage points higher than the U.S. Part of that is we've had sluggish job growth, as we mentioned before, not to the extent that the, not the same level of job growth as the U.S. has had. But the other problem is that we still have in migrants. People still think the economy here is better than what it really is. And so people are leaving other parts of the country and coming here. But here's one of the scary things, and I think we should all kind of take a look at this and realize we've got a long way to go. This is the unemployment rates, and these are the 10 worst states. This is out of 50, and North Carolina comes in fourth out of 50 in terms of worst unemployment rate January of 2012. Okay? So we are still one of four states, double digits. The others are, you know, poster child, uh, for, you know, Nevada, California. Rhode Island always has high unemployment rates. Okay? Um, Mississippi, Florida. Uh, you look at this and it is pretty much, you can see this, it is pretty much the states that suffered, with the exception of North Carolina, considerably in the housing crisis. Um, we didn't suffer that greatly in the housing crisis, but for some reason, uh, this economy seemed to have gotten hit a lot worse than the average state economy. When you're looking at the bright spot, there are some states that are just doing really fine. North Dakota, which everybody's heard about with the uh, drilling and, and stuff that's going on out there at 3.2 percent, but you still have a lot of other, and, and these all here are essentially extractive states where uh, it's agriculture and or mining, oil extraction, etc., keeping the rates low, but look, Virginia, 5.8 percent. So, you know, that's not an extractive state, that's a regular old state. Got a little bit of government going on there, but still, um, <clears throat> still seems to be doing fine. Minnesota seems to be doing fine as well, and Utah seems to be doing fine. So those are the states with 10 states with the lowest rates of unemployment. And remember, for this period, the U.S. rate is 8.3 percent. So things are better today than they were three months ago when we were here. The economy, folks, is getting better. And I suspect that the forecast that we've presented to you today will, in fact, hold up regardless of what happens with gas prices and what happens in the Middle East and what happens in Europe. I think that the numbers that we're looking at here, potentially another 2 million jobs nationally, another 50,000 jobs in the state over the year, I think these numbers will hold up fairly well. If anything, if gas prices don't rise too high, if we can stop them around $4, when we come back in June, we'll actually have better news for you. Um, and my suspicion is, and we'll have the forecast for 2013 in June for you, uh, my suspicion is 2013 will be even better uh, than 2012, that 2013 will actually feel like a real expansionary year, um, that enough things will come together in the second half of 2012 after we generate, you know, and get 5 million of those 8.7 million jobs back, things will really start to pick up. Because remember, potentially we could add 2.5 million to 3 million folks to the job roles that weren't there in 2011. And that amount of income is really going to change where the economy is going very, very quickly. Okay, So that's all the good news. Uh, the only bad news is that while the country is doing a little bit better and North Carolina is doing better, we're still not doing as well as we should. However, in Mecklenburg County and in the MSA, things are even better than that. Here are the keys to watch going forward. Keep your eye on consumer confidence. Just Google that every month. Check it out. See if it trends up. If it trends up, bet is things are going to go up. All right. Consumer debt, we want to make sure consumers are still willing to get into to debt. Keep your eyes on excess reserves. 
uh, the first Friday of every month. This time it wasn't because there was re-benchmarking go on, but normally the first Friday of every month we'll get the job number out. So come the first Friday in April, we're going to be looking for the March job number. And keep your fingers crossed if it's another 200 to 250,000 or better, things are going to continue to get much, much better. The first quarter GDP will be out April 27th. My, my estimation is that it will be probably pushing 4% or better. Uh, you heard me right, 4% or better in the first quarter of 2012. And of course, we always have to be leery of gasoline prices and the effect that they have is a drag on the economy. All right. So uh, overall, much, much better news this time than we've had last time. Uh, and I'm looking forward to June because we'll have another three months of information. And if everything continues the way it has the last three months, um, you know, I might, I might come up here and sing a song, okay? <laughs> All right, you actually don't want to hear that. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> that unemployment rate is made up of two things. It's people employed and people unemployed. And what we've been seeing is an interesting kind of a combination. We've actually seen the number of people employed fairly stable, but we've seen the number of people unemployed actually going down. Okay, and the reason it's going down is because and just the opposite of what you suggest, we actually see people dropping out of the labor force. What we've been seeing is kind of this strange situation that's been going on for the last several years. Remember that Congress extended the jobless benefits from the typical 26 weeks to the 99 weeks, so it's almost two years. People have to be classified as unemployed to collect those job benefits. And so consequently, they've got to be technically actively seeking work, which is the definition for being classified as unemployed. If you don't have a job and you're not looking for a job, you're not classified as unemployed, so you're not even in the statistic. What we're seeing is, and we saw this through most of 2011, particularly in the second half of 2011, people rolling off of those roles and simply dropping out of the labor force. And so we started to see the unemployed number go down. Therefore, we started to see the unemployment number rolling down before we really started to add those 200,000 plus jobs a month. And then when we started to add the jobs in the last several months, you've really seen a tapering off, a trailing off of the unemployment rate, okay? Because you have people leaving and now you've got job opportunities opening up and more people becoming, significantly more people becoming employed. So that's really the, the trend that's been going on here. And it's been taking place both nationally and in the state. I haven't looked locally, but nationally and in the state, we see the same kind of trend. Um, and it's amazing how kind of economists, this is the economist in me, how incentives matter in terms of people's behavior, okay? And so this is just an example of that. And so um, we should start to see this mitigate over time because we're really going to start to run out of significant numbers of people that are on that 99-week unemployment. Two things. In addition to jobs going up, we're also seeing average hours per week increase as well. So overall wages are going up, not so much because hourly wages are going up, but because number of hours worked are, are going up and therefore the wages are going up. So we're seeing that kind of thing. The interesting thing about the, of, of the, the labor market right now is we're starting to see, you know, real pressure on wages in some of the sectors that are growing, like business and professional services, health and educational services, where we're starting to see wages being bid up because of shortages in those areas, because they've been growing consistently for the last couple of years. But we're not seeing that in some sectors that haven't had that same kind of job growth or, in fact, are still losing jobs. So, you know, government, we're not seeing any wage increases there. We're not seeing any construction, manufacturing, obviously. But in business and professional services and health and human service, health and educational services, we are seeing uh, job growth in those areas. I mean, excuse me, wage growth in those areas. So it's a mixed bag, uh, but overall, what the modest increase in, in income levels that we're seeing are coming as a result of an increased number of people uh, working more hours. So that's basically where it's come from, yeah. When the banks pulled back after the collapse and went to cash and were in trouble, the first casualties of that was small business. Um, they were the ones that really got hammered the most, took the brunt of the, 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 um, the collapse, if you will, in the financial system, really hit small business. So you're right, that, that will change considerably. And I don't mean to be sarcastic in this. That'll change considerably for those small businesses that are still left. Okay, And I think that that coupled with what we really, I mean, I'm really optimistic about the second half of this year. So I, We have a lot of foreclosures, and in addition to that, we're probably going to see an increase, if you will, in foreclosures in the next couple of months. 
as after this settlement that was a couple of months ago, a month or so ago, and now banks will be able to start to get back into that foreclosure process. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, it's tough to say. The, the overhang of housing, vacant housing, is not going to be as big an, uh, an impediment to new construction as I think a lot of folks suspect it is. While they are substitutes, okay, for, foreclosed houses aren't substitutes for a wide range of new construction. And so they're substitutes, but they're not anywhere near perfect substitutes. So I can envision a situation where at the same time we're whittling, still whittling away at foreclosures, foreclosed properties, we start to see new construction start to increase. And we start to see um, you know, the residential construction, not like it was in the early 2000s, please, not to that level. But we'll start to see it pick up and increase modestly in 2013. So yeah, I think it's possible to have both of those things occur. What we see is a tremendous cyclical kick, if you will, to the economy that really hit construction and manufacturing. And it hit those two sectors because those sectors rely on consumer borrowing in order for people to purchase products from those sectors, whether it's housing or durable goods manufacturing. Um, most people, uh, that are, you know, maybe they could buy a washing machine, but they prefer to buy it 90 days or 60 days, same as cash, that kind of thing. And that money just di disappeared. If anybody was around in December of 2008 and you went into a Best Buy or a big box store and you looked at TVs, <clears throat> every year before that, they had the six months, one year, same as cash. Didn't have any of that. That's starting to come back, but not very prevalent. When's the last? I mean, you see some furniture stores doing it. But that's about it. You're not seeing any of the big box electronic stores and uh, doing that kind of stuff. And so you, you don't see any car dealers giving you, you know, 0% financing anymore. So, you know, that's, that's gone away. Um, so we had a big hit on those industries because of the, what's happened is it sort of accelerates the structural change that was already there. And so that's why a lot of folks have said, well, we're not going to get those manufacturing jobs back. But I will counter that a little bit, because we've seen some, some really solid increases in manufacturing, not just nationally, but in the state as well, where we've seen manufacturing jobs coming back. I wouldn't be surprised if we get about half of them back. Uh, I'm probably more optimistic than that. Construction's going to be a longer road to hoe because of construction on, on residential houses was way out of line in terms of where it could be. Cars and stuff weren't. But that's not going to come back completely. But I can see getting about half of those 200,000, uh, 2 million manufacturing jobs we lost, I can see getting half of those back uh, in the next several years. So uh, I'm a little bit, I, I think it was a lot more cyclical this time than it was structural, although there is that structural component. It's too early to tell. I mean, most of what we've seen has been in the heavy durable goods. I mean, Charlotte is a good example. I mean, they added, uh, last, uh, a couple of months ago, they added the second shift to the, uh, the truck plant in, in, in Gaston County. I mean, that's big. That doesn't happen unless they see significant changes in the orders. They can work at those folks overtime a lot easier than they can add a second shift. So adding a second shift is considerable. Companies don't do it unless they're fairly secure. If you're building more Class 8 trucks, you're shipping more goods in the country, okay? This is one of the strongest indicators, and it's not just the fact, the demo factory there that, that's seen that increase. We've seen this around the country as well. So we're truly, I think manufacturing is, is a little renaissance. We'll leave it at that. Um, and it is in the durable goods sector, not in non-durables. And it's where labor costs aren't as big a problem to compete internationally. It's more product-based than it is cost-based. And so uh, that, that, that helps us there in that. So I'm pretty more, I'm a lot more optimistic about return of durable goods manufacturing jobs now than I was a year or two ago. So, all right, I want to thank you all and I want to encourage you all to come in June because I'm really hopeful that we're going to have a much better story to tell. And you might even hear me sing. All right, thanks.